I love this time of year. One, because, well, I love being around family. I love the holidays. I love the food. I, I love everything that goes around with it. But I also fully aware that family can be awful tricky when we get together, okay? When we get together at these holidays, what I've learned is that these times can really amplify what's already there. So if you've ever had something against your sister or your brother, if uh, your parents kind of have issue, if your family has sort of a, a mixed sort of presence to it, some of these issues can just bubble up and boil during the holidays. Now, what happens to be a wonderful thing for us is that we're going to end Jacob's, or sorry, uh, Abraham's journey today with family. We're going to end with family, and then starting next week, we're going to get into more Advent-type topics. But I think we really do need to cover family uh, for today. And what we've read in our Scripture is a pretty messy uh, sort of picture of family for Abraham and what he's dealing with. This is nothing new, absolutely not, in our lives. One of the books that I love to I guess we had discovered and love to read now as I go through here is called, well, I'm going to put it on the screen here, is called The Original Folk Tales and so of the Brothers Grimm. It's a very interesting collection. It's the first edition, meaning when the Brothers Grimm, they are actually real two brothers, got together, there was a sense of uh, German nationalism about 1800, right around that time period. And so they were believing that the oral traditions of their people were being lost. So they set out to write down all of these folk and other tales, fairy tales, into print. And the, so they've collected all of these stories. Not all of them were German. But they collected all of these stories, and they put it into print and wanted to sell it. Now, it was originally pointed toward adults. And so there was lots of SEX, there's lots of violence, there's lots of disturbing topics in their first edition. Uh, actually, if you ever get a copy of this, a read, the story of Rapunzel is not what I remembered, okay? There's lots of SEX in that thing. And it's all inside of here, the, the adult version, the original tales that they collected. Well, as you can imagine, it didn't sell very well. And so what one of the brothers decided to do was to kind of dumb it down or kind of thin it out a little and maybe aim it at children. And so they took some of the SEX out. They kept the violence for some reason, like we do in our country, and they kind of changed a few things, one of which is really important for us today. In the original stories, it was the mothers and fathers, the original mothers and fathers who would kick them out of the house because there wasn't enough food. The mother who would kick him out for the witch to take care of, and it didn't sit very well, and so he decided to change it from mothers and fathers to, can you guess, the evil stepmother, the evil stepfather, to make it somehow more palatable. It was this general change of this time period in the literature that I believe has led to a lot of misconceptions as we look at blended families today, as we look at families around us. It, it's kind of an interesting thing that the culture has had to deal with. Definitely worth a fun read, but something that kind of has followed us all the way from the beginning. This whole idea of the not traditional family or these uh, a blended sort of understanding of what family means. And we watch shows like Modern Family and all these different iterations. But let's be honest, these are the exact same families that have been there since Genesis. Uh, there is absolutely no difference from the families we see today than there were for families that were in the book of Genesis. And I want to draw that out for us today. Another thing I'd like us to really talk about as we work through this is for you to fully understand and know that you are loved and you belong, absolutely, because of what God has done for us because you are part of a family that's even greater than the one you're looking around to. You are part of a parenthood, of a father that's even greater than the one that you might even experience here on earth. We're part of this incredible unit. And so today, let's, let's move through this quite messy story and see how families really haven't changed and how God has come into our lives and wants to bring this belonging and loving into it. So let's start at the beginning, shall we? Now, the Lord was gracious to Sarah, as He had promised, and the Lord did for Sarah what He 
Well, that delivered, right? Sarah became pregnant and bore a son to Abraham in his old age at the very time God had promised. Isn't that refreshing to have a text that focuses on what dads go through? I mean, yeah, I mean, yes, Sarah was really old too, but think about Abraham, you know, what he had to go through. Uh, I'm a little bit cheek and tongue there, of course. Uh, it, it, it's fun when we take a look at the Scripture, which makes it so awesome, by the way. So uh, they, they, they gave birth to the son that God had promised. Abraham gave the name Isaac to the son Sarah bore him. Isaac meaning sort of they were laughing at the whole situation. They were laughing at them. And so Isaac is like funny, humorous, right? It's the name. It's what it means. And so we have this being laid out. So this child is born to Sarah and Abraham. Now the child grew and was weaned, and on the day Isaac was weaned, Abraham held a great feast. And of course, this means off of mother's milk. And for me, I love that time period too. I love babies, don't get me wrong, but when we can play together as a dad, now I'm getting into my sweet spot. I can buy the toys I always wanted, and we can play together with all the new toys at Christmas, and I can get all those. It's an awesome time period, and apparently they celebrated it back then too. So it's a great time, and they were celebrating. But before this, if you didn't know, he was getting a little impatient because Sarah wasn't having a child, and so had a, had a child with Hagar, one of his servants, which was the custom of the time, and gave birth to a son named Ishmael. He would be about 13 right now, 14, so he's a tweeny, 13, 14, uh, what a time to have to live as a child. And so you had this other son from another mother around this whole celebration. And so it reads, the child grew and was weaned, and on the day Isaac was weaned, Abraham held a great feast. But Sarah saw that the son whom Hagar the Egyptian had born to Abraham was mocking. And so we see this blended family dealing with issues dealing with the struggle of life, of just trying to make everything work, of trying to show this love and belonging. And we see right away that the children in this relationship, that being Ishmael, is having a very hard time trying to figure all this out, trying to reconcile with all of this. And he's starting to mock, make fun of, you know, who is, the, you know, that whole process and really making a mess of it. And unfortunately for Ishmael, this action would set off a chain of events that would end up splitting the family. Uh, one of the things I like to do, of course I made this bigger, this is not my normal note, is I like to do something called create a shape of a story. And inside of it, uh, I like to just mark good, bad at the top and the bottom, and then sort of just like every other day in the middle. Well, I take a look at stories, and I just follow along and see kind of where it leads me. And in this story, these chain of events really seem to stick out because it starts with the celebration, right? So that's good. So it starts at the top. It's not a normal day. They're celebrating, but then Ishmael mocks, and then what happens? Well, then Sarah notices, and then Abraham has to deal with it. And it just seems to go downhill. This story just goes down and down and down. And wherever I see these changed in the story, I like to make a mark because those are usually when humans make the big mistakes or they show some heroic characteristic to change the story or God intervenes. So these are really cool points to kind of track in every story. And of course, uh, it just goes downhill for Ishmael. This is not going to be a good situation for him, at least for most of it. And so when I look at the, the, the difficulty and struggle that I see just with the, the kids at their time, I just ask the same question to you. Do children still have issues with one another today? Uh, do brothers and sisters still fight? And uh, yeah, don't be turned into your kids. Um, uh, yeah, you don't even have to look, right? Uh, th these are still happening today. There's no different. But even can the, 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 the situation with blended families, the dynamic of what that means on top of the situation just adds to it all. So what I'd like to do is invite uh, Galen Greer to join me. Uh, he is someone I've turned to along with his wife, Sarah, where I do not have a blended family. And 
when I counsel different families, at least initially, especially premarital and otherwise, I've learned to kind of lean and ask Galen, who does have a blended family, sort of what issues he goes through. And so I would just like to ask you the, the question as we talk today, what are some of the challenges that children face in blended families? So no pressure, but anybody here show of hands a, a product of a blended family? Anybody? Yep. Mm. So we have some folks who have kin thoughts and uh, kind of know what's going on with that. Um, one of the things that my wife, coincidentally enough, named Sarah also, one of the things that we found, and we're both from uh, broken marriages, um, one of the things that, w that we found as we came together, uh, went through a process of dating and falling in love, um, one of the things that we found was there's a song by Jason Gray that we both really learned to love, and it's called Death Without a Funeral. And if you think about when a marriage goes away, it's like a death, but there's no funeral. There's no grieving process. There's no ceremony, if you will, or anything like that. And that's the same kind of thing that happens with the children, is that um, Sarah actually tells of her younger brother, who both of her parents actually were married again, but he held on to for years, and now he's a man in his 40s, held on to for years that hope that his parents would get back together sometime, because that's, that's a very tough thing, and that is like a death to that child of that their parents are never going to be back together again. And um, so it's, it's, it's large with those kids, and I was talking to Pastor John about how Ishmael must have looked at his father, Abraham, and said, after it, Abraham said, you and your mom head out, but dad, because he was Abraham's uh, son as well as I Isaac, and the confusion that must have happened in his head, and how he reconc was how did he reconcile that so in in our family um, it's a completely different we're going to put up some uh, things later and some resources and talk some more about and there's a few resources out there but not a whole lot but a blended family and those of you who have been in it know that it's completely different than a traditional family has to be dealt with in every aspect completely different and I have to admit, I have to uh, confess that I did not handle it um, the right way in many times. And one of the things I had to learn was to say is, I'm sorry. And I had to, as C.S. Lewis says, the great, greatest sin is pride. I had to put that pride away to reconcile with those children. So, and, and those children always have that that connection with that blood relative, and there's a there's a conflict there within that home, you know, with that 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 parent they're they're living with and that step parent, and they feel a um, loyalty to the other parent that's not even there. So there's this conflict. So it's really really hard for the children in that situation. Thank you, Galen. So you have what naturally is already there between siblings, and now you, you exacerbate that or add the different element of sort of the two different moms in the situation. And of course, Ishmael is mocking, he's confused, he's in that time period as Galen pulls out, and it's just kind of ramping up. And Sarah, Isaac's mom, sees this, as it says, and she turns, she turns. Now, I don't think this was the first time they, they had this conversation, okay? That's why I say these t this time of year seems to amplify what's already there. If you watch her language, if you say, you know, this Hagar, who's an Egyptian, you know, she doesn't belong here, or, or Hagar, this slave, or this, or this helper, or this hired hand, and just you watch her language, Sarah. She's upset, and I'm sure these issues have come up, and you know in family there are some trigger words that that if they use it, they, you know that's just to dig or to deal with. Uh, these are issues that, that they're going straight through. Sarah sees that, and she goes off the handle. 
I'm sure for the last time. We're talking about a, a very public celebration with many people there, and she just, uh, she turns against Hagar and wants them both gone. And she said to Abraham, get rid, and these are harsh words, get rid of that slave woman and her son, for that slave woman's son will never share in the inheritance of my Isaac. Ouch. She repeats some very difficult words over and over again. And it's part of this whole process that I love the Bible for. Why would these ugly words, why would this conversation even be in here? And we ask that rightly because every other religious document in the world does not have this in it. They're scrub clean. All the people are perfect. Why does the Bible have this conversation in here? Because it actually happened. Because this is what Sarah said. Because this was a family who was trying to work through it. Families are not perfect. Families are always having to work through and figure out and, and, and bond together and work through struggle always, even at the beginning. And so it's there because it happened. And we read through this and we see, can, can't you just see an angry Sarah in front of everyone? This is it. I've had it. Get them out of here. Do parents still blow up at situations even today? Yeah, they certainly do. I've been sent to my room more than once in my life. I'll tell you that for free. And you're seeing all this come out in the Scriptures. And so it then leads me to the question here, Abraham's going to have a, a really hard time trying to figure this out. And you see one parent against another parent. You see sort of this step family trying to work through this. And so the next little bit, I, I just wanted to have a, a Galen come back and speak to as well as do parents ever disagree about how to discipline their kids? What do you guys think? <laughs> uh, uh, yeah, uh, you, you bet you we do. But then you, you add the element of a blended family, and uh, it just poses some unique sort of situations. So, Galen, uh, how would you respond to how parenting works through these disagreements about the children? As different as a blended family is from a traditional family, there's one thing that is completely the same as with all other conflicts in a marriage or whatever else. And the number one thing is communication. It is completely different, but communication between those, that husband and wife um, in the home is key. And as Lori reminded me in between services, communication also understanding. Sometimes it's the tone of voice that it's handled in. Sometimes it's, it's, it's different things. But compassion and the thing that brings you together in the second marriage, that love, all those things have to be held. That compassion, that love, that empathy between um, in, that, in that home with those, with those, with those children, with those ch stepchildren. Um, as I said, I didn't handle things completely very well and, and had to go back and, and rectify things and still do that sometimes today. So um, just communicate, understand. You had said something earlier about the, even, even to the point where maybe even the blood parent has to do the discipline with the child. Right. So there are just lots of different dynamics there that, yeah. Yeah, one of the things that... Uh, I really thought going into it that I'd handle it just like uh, in my previous marriage, in a traditional marriage, and it's nothing like that, and we'll give the resources here in a little bit, but one of the things I found out was that, um, and you know, you read things and you experts and people, and how many times do we do this in life, even when a minister brings something and we think, well, he doesn't really know what he's doing, and I read some things, and one of the things that I read in some of these books was that the discipline should be done by the blood parent. And in our situation, being the man, well, I found out the expert was right. So there's all kinds of things within, it's a completely different situation. Um, it, it needs to be handled completely differently. Thank you, Galen. 
Well, I'd like to take the time right now and just to make a really clear point about all of this, that there are some of us who will have this family experience or some of us who have been kind of assembled together as a family, but there's something very important for us to understand. Even as some of us will have no family to have Thanksgiving with or no family to be around for Christmas, especially this year, which is really hard, you are part of something greater. The reason why all sorts can come together to create a family, no matter how different mix you want to put it together, is because you are part of a greater family. You are part of something greater as a group. We are all part of this greater family that Jesus Christ delivers into our world. He calls us the children of God. He calls us Abba, he calls himself Abba, Father to us. We have this incredible dynamic that you are part of a family. You belong and you are loved. And uh, part of Galatians' work that Paul was getting at, he was actually dealing with this whole idea of, of Hagar by name and Sarah by name. And Paul goes back and forth showing the difference of this very Scripture reading we're talking about today. And he talks about this in between the text, trying to show us that all of these issues, whether you're of a blood family or not, whether you're of the inheritance or not, all this stuff God is not concerned about because there's something greater that makes us all family that allows all families to be called such a thing and why we are brought together. It says you are all sons of God through faith in Christ Jesus. You're all sons and daughters of Christ. Because you are sons and daughters, God sent the Spirit of His Son into your hearts, into our hearts, the Spirit who calls out, Abba, Father, Abba, Father. God could have chose any name for Himself. Think of our languages, any name, and He chooses Father. For those of you who've had a great father, you kind of get where He's going at. For those of you who have an absent or a difficult father, this can be hard. But a good father is one who is close who provides, who teaches, who cares for you, who nurtures you, who is as close to you as your next breath. This is someone who's incredibly important in the life of the children, and for goodness sakes, God says, I am that. I am your Abba Father. So you are no longer, as he said with Hagar and all that language, slave or any kind of this this, this language that would come up, but you are now family. And since you are now family, God has made you an heir. So all this conversation we're talking about in Jesus Christ means nothing because you are part of that greater family, and we can assemble by God's will in any different shape or form. And how cool is that? And that we're together in that way, that He gives that to us. Well, when Abraham heard what Sarah had to say, he was very distressed. It actually means disappointed as well. And in the original text, it says he was disappointed at Sarah, he's disappointed at God, and he's angry and distressed about the situation because Ishmael is his son. And in his eyes, they're equal. But God said to him, do not be so distressed about the boy and your maidservant. maidservant. Listen to whatever Sarah tells you. Oh, Lord, why did you put in the Scriptures that I have to listen to my wife? Over and over again, he repeats this theme. Um, and, and Galen, you have no help because his wife's named Sarah, so uh, you just got a double quick there. But he says, again, this whole story is a little disturbing, isn't it? it, it there's a lot going on here, but it's messy. It's imperfect. That's what we are. Do not be so distressed about the boy and your, your maidservant. Listen to whatever tells you to do. She is right. It is through Isaac that your offspring will be reckoned. But then the very next verse he says, but I am going to take over fathership, right? I'm, I want you to leave Hagar and Ishmael to me, and I'm going to make them a great nation. Do you know what God is asking Abraham to do right now? He's asking him to say, he's no longer your son. I'm now his father. Let him go. Do you know how impossibly difficult that would be for me to do, for my son, to say, he's no longer my son, he's yours? This is an incredible ask, and God's saying, you just need to hand him over to me and trust me, and follow through with Sarah and Isaac on your end. And this is what's being asked, and Abraham absolutely resists this. I am sure we're only hearing a little bit of the conversation I'm sure he pleaded, he's angry, he's talking, he's kicking around the dirt, his lips are moving, and people are thinking he's crazy in the corner because he's talking to himself. This is an issue. 
Abraham is greatly displeased with Sarah and with God and distressed about any kind of splitting up with the family. These are huge issues, aren't they? We see this in Genesis. We see this in the Brothers Grimm stories that have been collected from stories that are hundreds of years old, and we see that today. We haven't changed since we left the Garden of Eden, folks. These are family issues that we're all dealing with all the time. It's pretty amazing. Well, I guess uh, before I end everything and, and bring things to its conclusion, I had a question about what, you know, what are some of the, the, the practical ideas or resources that we can use? Um, because there's a lot of crazy stuff out there, but I just want to ask and say, hey, Galen, uh, if you had to point to one thing to start, uh, what, what would you recommend? Four or five years ago, Sarah and I had, I by no means have all the answers, but did a lot of research. And so there's a program called Divorce Care. And we thought, well, we've been through this. We can identify with some things. So we started uh, Divorce Care. If you know anything about Divorce Care, it's been around for many, many years. They've tweaked it. It's, it's a great program. They also have a, a program for, for, as we were talking about, kids that have been through divorce. And we started the program. And practically no one from LCM came. And it goes back to that pride issue, I think, but as we did some more research, we found that the other places, the other churches that had divorce care, almost always the people that go there are from other churches because there's still a stigma about um, blended families. And what I would tell you is that if, if you are having, if you're a product of that situation or if you know someone in today's society, um, the way our culture is, uh, marriages unfortunately almost seem disposable. Uh, myself, the pastors, uh, my wife, we would be love to talk to you. But one of the things that uh, a couple of books that we used, there's not surprisingly in, as I said, as much of this is going on, there's surprisingly few resources. But this gentleman, as you'll see, Ron Deal, uh, we discovered him and very, very thankful. Um, read some things that were very hard, uh, especially, like I said, in the discipline type area and some things and just trying to think of things differently. Uh, Smart Step Family of a Financial Planning, just like any other marriage, that, that is the same. It's, there's financial things can lead up to a lot of disagreements. The Smart Step Family, uh, the Smart Step Family Marriage, there's also one for each parent. So uh, it's a start, the smart step mom and the start, smart step dad. And I would encourage if any of you are in that situation, if you know someone, the smart step family and the smart step dad or mom. Thank you, Galen. Well, early the next morning, Abraham took some food and skin um, and a skin of water and gave them to Hagar, basically as much as she could bear. He set them on her shoulders and, they, and sent her off with the boy. She went on her way and wandered in the desert of Beersheba. Because think about it, where's she going to go? She's been displaced from the family. And so she's wandering around. And eventually when you're in the desert, you run out of resources. And when the water and the skin was gone, she put the boy, and this is such a sad scene too, she put the boy under one of the bushes then she went off and sat down nearby, about a bow shot away, for she thought, I cannot watch the boy die. And she sat there nearby and began to sob. This is a really hard story, isn't it? This is a really hard reality of the difficulties of family and situations. And, and from the very beginning, Genesis, to us today, we see this. But I, I truly believe that this is probably the first time Hagar has ever heard the Lord. This is the first time she's fully aware of the promise that he made to Abraham. And why God gets her into this situation before revealing himself is for him to know. But it is at this point that we have Abba Father, who made the promise, who would now come and deliver, right? Exactly what Abraham had said. Abba Father now cares and gives this this incredible little family of Hagar and Ishmael, a future, and would build Ishmael into a nation. It says that God heard the boy crying, and the angel of God called to Hagar from heaven and said to her, what is the matter, Hagar? Do not be afraid. 
God has heard the boy crying as he lies there. Lift the boy up and take him by the hand, for I will make him into a great nation. Uh, side note, take some time when we're done. I'm not going to cover it. Where is this nation still in the world today? Not what someone says it is, but where it actually is. It's kind of interesting. Follow up with that. Then the Lord God opened her eyes, and she saw a well of water. So she went and filled the skin with water and gave the boy a drink. You see God delivering on His promises, on the promise to be a father to them, to be there. Just like we are all one family, you all have one Abba Father. You have one caring center point. You have Jesus Christ that links all of us together. And this is such a wonderful gift to us to always know, no matter how the shape of your family begins to, to mold itself, no matter what you see around you, you are one family. You belong, you are loved, and you have one loving Father always with you, always. First, sorry, 2 Corinthians is always this joyous point where I, I really begin to understand this. As God has said, I will live with them and walk among them. I will be their God and they will be my people. I will be a father to you and you will be my sons and daughters, says the Lord Almighty, the Yahweh, the Adonai, the Creator, the God of all. I am yours, and I'm giving myself to you. Isn't that cool? We have that, and we've always seemed to have that. Well, God was with the boy as he grew up. He lived in the desert and became an archer. Kind of a weird dadded fact, I guess. While he was living in the desert of Paran, his mother got a wife for him from Egypt, of course. And so we see that God fulfilled His promise, spent that time with Him, and made His family into a great nation. Well, we've definitely taken quite a few dips and turns with Abraham and his journey. In the end, Abraham was not perfect. The people around him were not perfect. So what made… so, so then what was his family? I'm dreadful deaf in this year. What was his family? Yeah, imperfect. They weren't perfect either, right? Things really haven't changed much. From the very beginning, families have had to work through all of this. But what links us all together, what makes us a family, is that God has put us into this great household of His and links us all together. How cool is that? From the first book of the Bible to us meeting here today, God gives us family and all the different shapes and forms. Yes? You are part of that family, and you have a great father. Amen. Amen. I'd like to thank Galen Greer and Sarah Greer earlier who uh, gave a little advice, and uh, that's kind of cool. You have these resources with us, and so please, if, if these are issues you'd like to, uh, to ask for help, we have all different connections and, and a lot of different things that we can do to help, so just let us know. So, with that… I think let's pray together. Since we're all one family, and, uh, you know, since you're my brothers and sisters, let's just pray together as a family, yeah? Um, another thing God has told us to do as we kind of go out into this imperfect world of people. So let's pray our Lord's Prayer together. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever and ever. Amen. The Lord bless you and keep you. The Lord make his face shine on you and be gracious to you. The Lord look upon you with favor and give you peace. Gail and I will be in the back if you want to engage or have uh, questions. Otherwise, be safe. God bless.